Following many threats from cartels, Mexican artist Peso Pluma postpones his October concert in Tijuana. Narco Corrido, a type of music with lyrics that frequently approvingly elicit activity, mostly drug trafficking, has become more and more popular. Because of the deadly nature of the drug trade, rappers have frequently been targeted for dealing with the wrong cartels. These five musicians hate ever glorifying the cartels with their songs. Welcome to True Crime, let's get started. Number 1. Chalino Sanchez Chalino was not a rapper, rather, he was a performer and a musical icon in Mexico, but his musical style and the events leading up to his demise are undoubtedly among the most horrifying tales you will hear today. Chalino was born in Sinaloa, Mexico, on August 30, 1960. He comes from an extremely poor family, living with both his parents, seven brothers, and one sister. At the age of 15, Chalino's sister was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, Chalino promised to seek revenge for his sister. He was aware that El Chapo Perez, a local, was among those in charge. His time for revenge came four years later. He saw Perez. He went up to him and shot him at close range, killing him right away. A gunfight broke out, and Chalino made it away unharmed. However, Perez's men saw his face, so he was unable to return home. That night, Chalino fled Sinaloa, but the following morning, he was facing the problems that would ultimately take his life. He moved to Tijuana and assisted Mexicans crossing into the United States. Chalino eventually crossed over and relocated to Los Angeles, where he and one of his brothers traded in small quantities of cocaine and marijuana. However, by the time he moved back to Mexico, his brother was killed. He spent almost 18 months behind bars after his arrest. However, this is when Chalino began creating Narco Corrido songs, which glorify the lives of drug dealers. This made Chalino very renowned at the time because no other artist was doing it. After being released from prison, he returned to Los Angeles. He performed live in crowded cities after hiring a band to record his songs. Chalino changed the Mexican music landscape and the Los Angeles music scene in 1989 when he recorded his first 15 tracks. But one show in particular made Chalino realize his days may be running out. January 25, 1992, Sanchez was performing at the Plaza Los Arcos restaurant and nightclub in the desert city of Coachella. He was on stage accepting music suggestions from the crowd when Eduardo Gallegos, a male, stepped up to make a request. He pulled out his pistol as soon as he stepped onto the stage and fired four shots at Chalino. Chalino reacted by drawing his gun and firing back, taking a blow to the armpit but managing to survive. However, he realized right then and there that the next show he did might be his final one. Chalino sold the rights of his songs to a record label after the Coachella event, using the money to pay for a down payment on a home for his wife and two children. Chalino took an offer to perform in the renowned city of Coyoacan in order to pay off the house and leave his family with a fortune in case something happened to him. Yes, the Sinaloa cartel calls Culiacan home. Every roadway and location is under their authority. Considering the genre of music he did, Chalino was aware that performing there would be risky. However, he was ready to step into the belly of the beast as long as his family would be safe. Unfortunately, he was not going to live. May 15, 1992. Chalino continued to perform at a concert in spite of warnings from his friends and family and even death threats. A fan forced his way to the front of the stage to give Chalino a song request. However, the look on his face indicated that it was not a request, but rather a message informing him that his performance there would be his last. The moment he read that note, you could see the horror on his face. Whatever happened, he kept singing. He left with numerous young women, a cousin, and his two brothers. On their way home, they would get stopped by armed men in Chevrolet Suburbans, who pretended to be police. One of the soldiers flashed his badge to Chilino, saying, My comandante needs you. Given that it was usual for Mexican police to take bribes, Chalino and his brothers attempted to give the men money. Regretfully, they turned down their offer. Chalino handed himself over to the men who drove away with him. Twelve hours later, two farmers find a man in a ditch who has two bullet holes in the back of his head and rope markings around his wrists. Yes, it was Chalino Sanchez. Who killed him? They would conduct an investigation, but find nothing. 
However, some sources indicate that there are three main suspects to hold responsible. Number two, Peso Pluma. Peso Pluma, a Mexican megastar, performed on stage during the two-day music event in the country's capital. During his performance, he put the microphone up to the estimated 100,000-person crowd in Mexico City who sang the initials JGL in unison. This was a reference to El Chapo, also known as Joaquin Guzman Loera. Pluma may not have thought much about the reference he paid to the drug lord El Chapo while he was incarcerated, but the Jalisco New Generation Cartel took it very seriously and planned to get revenge. Hassan Emilio Caban de Laija, better known as Pluma, was born in the Mexican town of Zapopan on June 15, 1999. Yes, the CJNG is based in Jalisco, but unlike other teens his age, Peso Pluma has never become connected with cartels at least not yet. He began playing the guitar at the age of 15, watching YouTube videos. Afterward, he started to write songs in a diary. The songs of Narco Corrido singers Chalino Sanchez and Ariel Camacho, who narrated tales of the Mexican drug trade, served as inspiration for him. One thing about the Narco Corrido style of music you should be aware of is that prominent drug dealers frequently attack the singers, particularly when they glorify their rivals. However, Having grown up in a violent environment, Peso had no intention of being involved in conflicts. As a result, in July 2022, he made a significant breakthrough outside of Mexico. His third studio album, Genesis, had billions of plays on Spotify and debuted at number three on the Billboard All Genre Album chart, the best ranking ever for an album including Mexican music. However, Peso Pluma also got himself into a lot of difficulty by uplifting El Chapo in a few songs. Pluma sings in the song Siempre Pendientes about the life of a cartel member from Sinaloa who guards El Chapo. This did not sit well with the CJNG. Because several criminal organizations are still fighting for dominance, Tijuana consistently has one of the highest homicide rates in the nation. This basically suggests that the CJNG's influence in the community would be undermined if Peso Pluma performed in this place while honoring El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel in his songs. So they probably believe the name El Mencho should be on his lips instead of Chapo. However, Peso Pluma has refused to explain why he glorifies El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel in his songs. Eventually, Peso Pluma and his team had to cancel the Tijuana event to secure his safety. Yes, when these individuals make such threats, they aren't joking. Earlier in 2023, a narco corrido band from Sinaloa State signed autographs at Tijuana Mall ahead of a planned show when gunmen opened fire near the crowd. The band was given a warning to leave the city or face consequences in a banner signed by the Jalisco cartel, which was left at the scene. Peso Pluma won't be the first, and he most definitely won't be the last to receive a warning of this type from these cartels. Number 3. Mr. Yosi Locote, April 19th, 2018. In the western city of Guadalajara, the corpse of 42-year-old Mexican rapper Mr. Yosi Locote was disposed of in an empty lot. A screwdriver was plunged into his chest, along with a message from the CJNG cartel, which had organized his death. And this man over here, who's not even Mexican, got into trouble with one of the most violent cartels around. On January 20th, 1976, he was born in Bakersfield, California. But Mr. Locot ended up in Guadalajara, Mexico, where he got involved in rap and joined a street gang. There's no doubt that rap lovers are familiar with his two hit songs, Pibalazos and Esto Es En Serio. These were the tracks that made him famous and established him as one of the nation's top rappers. Similar to Mexico's Snoop Dogg, he rapped honestly about his experiences living on the streets, and I mean that it is a positive manner. However, the greatest error he would make in his lifetime, adhering to the Cholo dress code. However, things took off after Mr. Yosi Locote released his first album in 2012, titled 13 Hood Rules. The Florence 13 fought for further territory in Guadalajara. Furthermore, the CJNG was relatively new to the city at the time. These individuals were responsible for massacres. They carried out lethal captures of security forces and even attacked multiple military helicopters with rocket launchers. But the only thing CJNG did to quell the storm 
was kidnap Mr. Yozi Lokote. April 17, 2018, two days prior to the discovery of his lifeless corpse, Mr. Yozi Lokote went missing from a Guadalajara local market. The CJNG was behind the kidnapping. They were aware that Mr. Lakote's influence in the community had a significant role in the street gang's rapid climb to prominence in the city. So, if he was gone, it would be easier for them to come in and sweep the gang out. And in typical CJNG style, they wouldn't just shoot a bullet straight to his head. They would hold him down and ruthlessly stab him with a screwdriver. Like they usually do, they left a note. However, this one stated that everyone who continues to support Cholo will suffer this. Despite the fans' demands for justice, no one has been put on trial for this homicide. Number 4. Lefty SM 2nd September 2023 Three gunmen killed well-known Mexican rapper Lefty SM in his Jalisco, Mexico home. Some claim it was a failed robbery. However, his wife believes it was a planned attack. What precisely happened then? Lefty SM was born on April 22, 1992, in San Luis, Rio, Colorado, Mexico. His career in music started at a young age. Because he was left-handed, his close pals lovingly called him Lefty. He began pursuing music at the age of 16, while still working as a mechanic. His early releases included slow G-funk sounds paired with a strict hip-hop sound. It was very dope, and it drew inspiration from numerous genres resulting in a distinct and versatile style. His distinct style convinced him to sign with the well-known Alzada Records. It was a huge one for him, but it also marked the beginning of his end. A well-known character in the urban rap industry in Mexico, Lefty SM became well-known worldwide via YouTube, where he gathered 2.5 million followers following his debut in 2017. Avion de Papel, his 2019 album, displayed even more of his talent. The next year, he would collaborate with Santa Fe Clan on the Por Mi Mexico. In addition, Lefty has also worked with more well-known rappers. Up until the sad event, he was possibly the biggest rapper in Mexico. On September 2, 2023, three armed attackers rushed into Lefty's home and tried to take him away by force while he and his wife, Isa Mary, were sleeping. When they were unable to do so, they switched to violence, opening fire and fleeing the scene. At around 1.15 in the morning, Lefty was shot twice and taken to the hospital, but eventually passed away from his injuries. All of his followers still carry a haunting memory of his last performance, which took place at Teatro Metropolitan in Mexico City the night before. Number 5. QBA One golden rule that all members of CJNG must comply with is to never, I mean never, tell anyone else about its inside operations. By breaking this golden rule on April 22, 2018, QBA unintentionally gave Mexican police access to confidential information about some of his relationships and activities related to the cartel. You see, Christian Palma, 24, better known by his stage name QBA, was nothing more than El Mencho's puppet despite being a well-known rapper in public. He was one of the pioneers of Rap Malandro, or Thug Rap, along with Mr. Yozi Lakote, whom we discussed before. In addition to millions of views, his YouTube account has over 200,000 subscribers. However, his videos weren't exactly what one would anticipate from a well-known performer. The videos were taken in poor areas of Guadalajara, the state capital of Jalisco, and portrayed young people displaying guns and doing narcotics. His songs included references to meth and various cartel atrocities, which put QBA in the bad books of the CJNG for the first time. On March 19, 2018, three film students went missing from the town of Tonala in western Jalisco State. These three students were filming at a CJNG ranch when QBA and two other CJNG members mistaken them for rival cartel members. The entire country was outraged when the three students' missing persons report surfaced. In the meantime, QBA and his men in the cartel camp continued to believe that these individuals were members of the rival cartel. After torturing one of them, they murdered the remaining individuals. Normally, these people would have just dumped the victims on the streets, but after seeing how furious Mexicans were over the case, they chose to dissolve the bodies in sulfuric acid, and QBA was the perfect person to accomplish it. QBA worked for the CJNG for around $150 per week, dissolving corpses in acid. After being arrested and making a confession, QBA found himself in a serious situation. So what did he say? 
In his confession, he explained his connection to the CJNG through the notorious street gang in Furnace 21. But when the gang split up, he joined the cartel. In some of his song lyrics, he exalted crystal meth, crack, and other inhalants. That was his way of giving the CJNG some respect for dominating the Mexican meth market. QBA detailed every step of the CJNG's meth production process in his confession, from importing chemicals through Mexico's seaports to cooking the end result in secret labs. Why would he do this now? Well, some say it's because they allegedly killed one of his closest friends the previous year. However, the CJNG is an unstoppable criminal organization. The core of this cartel's operations cannot be shaken by the Mexican government, the DEA, or even QBA's confession. Numerous rappers have paid tribute to him, with tracks released following his arrest and confession. He is currently being held at the Puente Grande Jail in Guadalajara, where he may get a maximum sentence of 140 years. But is he truly secure in prison? Will they plan an inside attack? Our thoughts and prayers go out to those involved. We hope you enjoyed our true crime overview of Times Rappers Messed with the Wrong Cartels. Be sure to be a true crime subscriber and hit the bell icon to never miss another true crime video. Leave a comment and a like to show your support. Until next time, stay safe. And if you have a true crime story you would love to see, please be sure to leave in the comments below. We look forward to seeing you in our next video. You in our next video.